Hello and welcome to Focus on Liberia. My name is Dennis Jai and we are broadcasting from Atlanta, Georgia. Today in commemoration of Black History Month, we are discussing the history of Liberia. And welcome to our guest, Dr. Timothy D. Nevin, who's joining us. So we sound our palace samba to welcome Dr. D. Nevin. Doc, welcome to Focus on Liberia. Thank you so much, Dennis, for having me. Uh, this is a great privilege, and you've got a great audience. Thank you. And uh, if you heard the drum roll, that's uh, Dr. Tim Nevin. That's welcome. Uh, he is our guest tonight, and we're going to continue our topic on librarian history. Tonight, we're going to be delving into Chief Swakoko. Some, mm -hmm. some call her Madame Swakoko. Nay, Swakoko, meaning Mother Swakoko, Madame Swakoko. So we're going to be discussing the life and the time of Chief Swakoko. My guest is Dr. Tim Nevin. He's been professor of history at uh, Tubman University in Maryland, uh, Harper, Maryland County, from 2013 to 2015. Also professor of history at Cardinal University, 2015 to 2018. And during that time, he's uh, been engaged in a lot of research on Liberia. He uh, researched yeah. Dr. Uh, Chief Swakoko. He also did a research on uh, Bella Yala, which we're going to talk about later on. But uh, Dr. Tim, again, we are glad to have you for the first time. We extend you our ceremonial cola as we went <laughs> to focus on Liberia. Thanks for coming again. Oh, uh, thank you so much. And I, I decided to wear some uh, country cloth. Uh, in commemoration of Madame Swakoko, and so we, we look like cousins now. Definitely, and that, yeah. that's the goal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's great to be here. Uh, I'm I'm live from uh, my current uh, city of residence, which is uh, Louisville, Kentucky, and um, hopefully some of my former students in Vaughan County and Maryland County can tune in. I know it's a little bit late. It's about 11 p.m. in uh, Monrovia right now, Liberia time. But um, if you are tuning in, thank you for watching. Thank you, thank you so much. And uh, you published an article in search of the historical Madame Swakoko, Liberia's renowned female pellet chief. Also, your doctorate is in uh, African history, if I'm not mistaken. And you, let's let's start with that. What the uh, what sparked this interest in uh, African history? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I do uh, have my, my PhD is from the University of Florida and that's 2010. And my master's degree is from University of Illinois at Chicago um, in the year 2000. So uh, I started off, uh, I'm from Chicago originally and I started off going to University of Illinois at Chicago way back in 1993. And I had a, I started off as just a generic history major. And then um, as you go along your academic career, you tend to specialize. And I had a, a mentor, a professor uh, named Dr. James Searing, who is sort of like a, uh, a mentor to me, almost like a father figure. He took me under his wing and his specialty was the history of Senegal. So he was fluent in um, French and the uh, Wolof language. And he did research in Senegal and wrote several books on Senegalese history. Um, anyway, he took me under his wing and uh, he encouraged me to continue to get my master's degree which is uh, two years of further study after you graduate with your bachelor's degree. So I sort of specialized from starting off as just a generic history major to eventually specializing in African history. And then when I entered graduate school in 2003 at the University of Florida, uh, that was another eight year journey for me to get my, my PhD. And I eventually chose a Liberian topic for my dissertation. And that topic is the history, uh, social history of Liberian popular music during the Tolbert years and the Doe years. So 
looking at how music developed and how music was produced and how it changed from 1970, um, you know, when, uh, when President Tolbert uh, came into power upon the death uh, uh, 1971, actually, of uh, President Tubman, and then uh, going through the, um, the 1980 coup, you know, with uh, Sar uh, Master Sergeant Samuel uh, Kenyon Doe coming to power with the PRC uh, and the military uh, junta in the 80s. So really, I was looking at, I was interviewing a lot of musicians and finding out how these political and social changes that Liberia went through during the 1970s and the 1980s under military rule, how those changes affected uh, the music and the musical production. So I was looking at um, people like Princess Fatu Gayflor, Morris Dorley, uh, Tipan Nimle, um, and, um, and, and others like uh, Miata Fambule and people like that. So, so that was a 330 page dissertation that I wrote and completed uh, in 2010. And now I'm trying to turn that into a book project. So it, it is a book manuscript right now. Right, great. And you also look at T.J. Jlu. Right, so they're the, the crew uh, folklorists. They, the group, uh, I interviewed uh, Anthony Experience Nagbe, who came from the football realm and was was part of uh, one of the leaders of T.J. Jlu. And, um, and I write about them in my, in my dissertation. And uh, very interesting and very sort of uh, progressive politically, uh, but also keeping the um, crew uh, folk music alive, uh, especially at uh, football matches and uh, things like that. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, exciting, exciting music. Yeah, I enjoy, I enjoy the music. Now, now it, it took you to Liberia, and uh, you're doing the history. You're teaching history at uh, Tadmer University, also Cottingham. And now mm -hmm. you decided to write on Madame Swakoko. I mean, why Chief Swakoko? Why was yeah, well, Swakoko I thought it was you never find out? Actually, so as you mentioned, I was, uh, I was down in Maryland County for two years uh, from, um, from 2011 to 2013. When I was there, um, I did a lot of local historical research. So I, I wrote on um, this place called Devil's Rock, for example, which is on the beach uh, close to Harper City. And it's a nature shrine and it has a 300 year long history wow. of people performing rituals there and worshiping there. Uh, so I wrote a history of that. So I, I tend to, um, when I'm when I'm stationed somewhere for work, when I'm when I'm living there for work, uh, I would seek out these topics in Liberian history that no one has written about yet. So sort of unexplored uh, topics in Liberian history, and um, and then try to set up uh, oral history interviews, you know, with local elders uh, to get more information about uh, the oral traditions and, and oral histories that may not have been written down yet, you know? So uh, so when I came to uh, Bonk County, I came and I moved onto the campus of Cuttington University in um, 2015. And I was, um, Cuttington University campus is uh, three miles north of uh, the town of Swakoko. So it was very close and I had my motorcycle and I could go down there anytime I wanted to. It was very convenient. So um, I realized that uh, Madame Swakoko was a unique figure because uh, there's probably less than 1% of the chiefs in Liberian history are female chiefs, you know? So mm -hmm. there's a very small minority of people, uh, uh, females that became chiefs. And so, um, so she must have had a very strong personality and been able to um, convince people to follow her for different reasons, you know. So um, it was the perfect opportunity. Like I said, I was there living in Bonk County for a total of three years uh, in, in the Swakoko district. And um, 
this article that I wrote is almost 40 pages. It was published in the Journal of West African History, which is published by uh, Michigan State University. And the, the article actually took me about four years to write. So I interviewed a lot of elders in Bonn County and Swakoko. I became friends with the, uh, the, uh, the town chief there, uh, Chief Arthur Wena in um, Swakoko town. I interviewed him several times. And then I went through the uh, literature and I searched for any reference mm. in the travel literature to Madame Swakoko. Uh, and then I um, took note of all those uh, references that I found and I incorporated them into the article along with the oral traditions and the oral history that I had covered by doing these oral history interviews. Good. So kind of comparing the written record with the oral history. Oral history. And, and, yes, that's okay. there, yeah. and we're gonna get more into Swakoko. I also yeah. want to mention that you've been associated with the Librarian Studies uh, Journal, LSJ, for a long time. I, I, oh. I want to mention that because uh, there's, a, there's a, 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 a scholarly group and they've been doing very well and you've been associated with that for a while now. And in your quest for looking at things that, that are not really written about in Liberia, you also wrote about the notorious Bella Yala. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, that's right. So uh, Bella Yala prison um, up in what was Lower Lofa County and um, it's got an 80 year history. So it was opened in 1910 and then it was closed in the beginning of the Civil War uh, when the NPFL rebels came to Bella Yala in 1990. I think it was August 1990. So it was a functioning military prison for 80 years, but it was notorious for housing uh, political prisoners as well as uh, common criminals uh, at Bella Yala. It was also known for being isolated. There was no roads leading there. There was only uh, trails. So um, a lot of the political prisoners were flown there. And uh, it's kind of a hard place to reach. Uh, I visited there at Bella Yala two times, took a lot of photographs, and I interviewed a lot of people there. And I tried to piece together this 80-year uh, history, um, especially focusing on political prisoners from the 60s and the 80s. So um, a lot of them are still alive, some political prisoners that spent time there in the 80s, uh, people like um, Professor Alharik Tokpa and Ezekiel Pajibo. Right, yeah. Oh, well, so that was also published in the same journal, that Journal of West African History. Thank you. And uh, I, when I, I was talking about LSA Labro Studies, Association, I, I said Labro Studies Journal, the book that they published by actually LSA, Labro Studies Association. And right. uh, Dr. Tim has been part of it for a long time. And so your friend right. at LSA, Jackie Sayese, LSA all the way. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. It's a great organization. That they, I think I've published about seven or seven articles or so in the Liberian Studies Journal, which is produced by the Liberian Studies Association. And we're still waiting for it to go online so that people can access those articles uh, digitally, you know, online. And that would be a great help because um, it's very hard to get uh, access to copies of the Liberian Studies Journal in Liberia. And uh, if you go to the top floor of the University of Liberia Library uh, in Capitol Hill there, you will see a lot of these old copies. I think the uh, the first issue of the Liberian Studies Journal came out in, I believe, 1966. Ooh. So uh, a complete set has been donated to the University of Liberia, and they still are up there in the, the top floor of the library. I've been up there several times. All right. So uh, yeah. before. Thank, thank you, thank you, Dr. Nevin. Ladies and gentlemen, if you just join us, this is Focus on Liberia. Our topic tonight is the life and time of Chief Swakoko. And uh, just before we get into it, just uh, you got some love out there, uh, Dr. Nevin. Jackie, say hi, team. So good to see you. 
La Brown yeah, yeah, yeah. Association is well represented. Franklin Weller say, hello team, looking good, my friend. Yeah. yeah. You have put in something on here, Dr. Nevin, I'm watching from Liberia. Uh-huh. And uh, you have uh, Musa Moba, how dark? Have you thought of writing about Liberia before the coming of the free sleep? We will get into that. Just wanted to say you have some uh, people here saying, hello, hello, hello. Eugenia say, knowing our history is very vital. Full disclosure, uh, Eugenia is right here with me in studio. Excellent. All right. That's, That's great. Well, I'd like to I'd like to shout out to all my former students at Tubman University and also at Cuttington University and all my friends in, in Morovia, uh, Sony and my good friend, uh, Dr. Bill Allen, who's at University of Liberia. My, my good friend, uh, Joseph, Dr. Joseph Seguano, who's uh, up in Santa Quelli right now. Right. And so we want to go right into it about the uh, the life and time of Madame Swakoko. And uh, just to start, we want to say here is a, uh, you can see Dr. Tim there conducting this, uh, doing the research. And opposite that, you see the, the compound of Chief Madame Swakoko all the way in Swakoko, Bond County. Dr. Uh, Robin, let's, let's, let's get started about your article, a, a summary of uh, Madame Chief Swakoko. Yeah, very good. So that photograph um, on the left was with, my good friend, Dr. Paul Kanmu Ricks, and he is the Pele teacher uh, at Cuttington University. Um, I'm not sure if he's still teaching or if he's retired yet. You know, a lot of people in Li Liberia, they never retire. So uh, he's, he might still be teaching. Anyway, uh, but yeah, so I've, I reread my, my article last night and I made some notes uh, sort of... Um, Cliff notes uh, about the article to try to sum it up. Um, but basically, uh, I've got a timeline that I'll go through uh, in a little bit. But uh, we know that uh, Madame Swakoko was born around the year 1850. And we don't know the exact year. It's impossible to know the exact year because uh, people were not using the Western Gregorian calendar you know, in Pele land at that time in the 1850s. But I'll explain how we have an educated guess that she was born around 1850. I'll explain how we know that a little bit later, but we know that she died in 1934, uh, approximately, we believe approximately 84 years old when she died. And um, I'll explain why we, why we think that. But she's um, one of the few chiefs uh, along with um, King Boatswain, which was also known as Sao Boso, who was considered sort of a, a good native leader or a uh, someone who sided with the government in Monrovia at the time uh, and the Liberian Frontier Force. Um, and so that's sort of how she's remembered. It, it's interesting because the chiefs that tended to fight the frontier force and resist uh, people like Guegue have sort of been erased from history to, uh, altogether. But uh, we still know the name of King Salboso. There's a front street has been named after him in Monrovia. And with Madame Swakoko, we have the Trans-Liberia Highway that goes from Red Light District all the way up to Ganta. The, the stretch of that Trans-Liberia Highway that goes through Bonk County has been named the Swakoko Highway. Uh, we also have the Swakoko Chiefdom. We have the Swakoko District. So, uh, and I'll talk about, there's also the uh, uh, Madam Swakoko Center for Rural Women's Empowerment uh, that's been opened up as well on the Cuttington University campus. So, um, one thing that we have to realize is she was born into a very different world than we're familiar with. She was born into a pre-monetary society. So that means they were not using currency back in the 1850s. Uh, currency in rural Liberia was largely introduced with uh, the coming of Firestone, you know, um, and paying with wages. We know Firestone came in 1926. 
Um, but instead, we can think of the wealth in people. We can think of this concept of wealth in people. The wealthy people in her society were people who were able to control the labor and the reproduction of large groups of people, followers. So think of this uh, wealth as wealth in people, being able to influence and control people and have people work for you. Um, uh, also, she grew up in a time like in the, around 1900 when she became the, uh, a really famous chief in this area of uh, Swakoko area today. Um, this was before the widespread use of guns. So we have some homemade guns here. And then the Frontier Force, the Liberian Frontier Force is Liberia's first army. And that was created in 1908. So they, when they came into the hinterland, of course, they were well armed. And uh, we'll talk about that later. But for the most part, people were using a lot of a lot different uh, weapons uh, besides guns at that time. It was also a slave owning society. There was slavery going on when she was growing up. Uh, there were uh, Pele people, uh, sorry to say, being uh, sold into slavery and transported to the Grand Cape Mount area, for example. We had uh, domestic slavery and chattel slavery going on at that time uh, in Vi country. Um, anyway, uh, the other thing that's that's different, you know, is Madame Swakoko was living in a what we call pre-literate society. So most people, uh, this is before the introduction of the English language written text before the introduction of the Bible, uh, before the first missionaries. And so we did have uh, some Mandingo traders who were literate in the Arabic language, for example. But the, the Pele script itself, there is a Pele script to be able to write the Pele language. That was invented in 1933, so almost the time when Madame Swakoko died. So this is what you call pre-literate society. It's an oral society, um, not relying on written texts, but relying on uh, oral transmission of traditions and laws and uh, societal rules and this kind of thing. So, um, you know, she was alive during, she witnessed the loss of Pele uh, political autonomy uh, at this time. And we can talk about that, how. Pele land was incorporated into the Republic of Liberia. Um, and this name, Nesua Coco, means accomplished or respected mother. The, the name Coco, from my research, it, it, it means the fifth uh, female born child. So that's coming from um, uh, Pele language, of course. Uh, okay, so. Um, she became a elder ritual specialist, a sort of priestess and judge. She was raised in the Sande uh, Bush, the Sande School, which is um, traditional African education. The, another thing to remember about her is that she never uh, converted to Christianity. So she remained faithful to African traditional religions her entire life. You know, she was living before the first missionaries even came to what is today uh, Bong County, right? So uh, she was, she became a Zoe and her mother was also a Zoe. So she was coming from a family of Zoes and she became a feared and respected uh, and obeyed leader of course, by the time she was uh, an adult. Um, she was a brilliant person. She mastered the arts of Sande leadership and instruction, but also herbalism, which means knowing all of the local plants and the medicinal properties that they have. Also horticulture, of course, she was growing rice and other uh, foodstuffs. Strategic warfare, hospitality, diplomacy, peacemaking. Um, one of the reasons that she became so powerful is that 
she refused to remarry after her first husband died. So we believe her first husband was named Pamha. We don't know exactly when he died, but she eventually did have allegedly uh, five sons and two daughters. However, a lot of these uh, children died in, in childhood. So this is before modern medicine and you had a large number of children that, that didn't make it to age five um, that died before then. But anyway, her, um, her grandson, Molga Yongo, did become a chief. Um, and two of her contemporaries are people that some, some of our viewers may be familiar with these names. Uh, these were chief warriors that were living at the same time as Madame Swakoko that she interacted with. Uh, the, the big name uh, from Pele Land is uh, Bayan Koli Wolomian, sometimes just called Wolomian. He's from Tomu Town, and he was involved in a lot of warfare during that, that time. Uh, one of his chief rivals was this a warrior named Bido, who was also a, a Pele chief and a warrior at that time. Um, she ruled over this area called uh, Kiaye, uh, like I said, from about 1900, and then um, eventually made the famous trip to visit uh, uh, President Daniel Howard um, in 1912. We believe that she was carried on a, on a stretcher, you know, Pelican, all the way down to Monrovia in 1912 to meet with President Daniel Howard during his first year of uh, being a president. She had all these people under her control um, from the oral traditions, uh, hunters, farmers, watchmen, cooks, informers, which are basically spies, uh, able-bodied men, warriors were under her command, and a lot of desirable young women as well. And these are the people who made her famous. Uh, one of the analogies in the oral traditions about Madame Swakoko is that she was like a mother hen who lifted her wings and had a lot of uh, baby chicks, for you know, this is the analogy, uh, under her wings. So she was, she was protecting a lot of people and a lot of, you might have heard of the ward system and the pawn system where yeah. people would donate their sons and daughters to her to take to raise them and to protect them and take care of them and then later she would negotiate the uh the marriage of these young ladies uh in exchange for work you know young men suitors would come and work for her in order to marry these uh young ladies that were essentially her adopted daughters uh from her compound so um okay um in some ways, she was like, she was, her brilliance was not only peacemaking, trying to bring warring factions, to, factions together and, and unite them and bring peace to the region, but also as someone who was uh, a master of hospitality. And so she, there were no hotels at this time, of course, <laughs> The road to Kakata was only finished in uh, 1926, um, I believe. The uh, so this was a trade route that that her town was on, uh, and there were just trails going through the the hinterland all the way up to the border with what's now Guinea, up by uh, Ganta or Gompa, right? So people would stop in her compound, and she would feed them. She would give them water and somewhere to sleep, uh, a protected place in uh, overnight. So her compound had high walls uh, for protection, and she would, uh, you know, she would have a, a safe area for them to come and stay in um, as they were traveling either north or coming south to Monrovia. Um, she didn't speak. Mandingo, but she had a Mandingo translator so that she could communicate with Mandingo traders 
And after 1922, a lot of the Mandingo traders moved to Banga and set up uh, shops there. Um, okay, so basically the, um, the trade goods that were going up and down um, past Madame Swakoko's uh, compound were things like cloth, cola nuts, tobacco, beads, rum, iron tools, dried goods, uh, and some enslaved people, as I mentioned, there was a slave trade at that time. Um, and But it's interesting because um, her followers, Madame Swakos, Swakoko's followers, identified themselves by their clan. And we know what a clan is. It's a group of people that claims a common ancestor. And this is a patrilineal clan that's going through the father's line, right? And so... There was no sense of uh, a Pele nation at that time, but people identified as being part of this clan. And now currently in the Swakoko uh, chiefdom, we have seven, seven different clans and I, and I list the names of those seven clans in my article. But it's interesting that people identified themselves with their clan at that time. They didn't have a sense of I'm uh, Pele, you know, uh, in other words, they didn't have a sense of one unified Pele nation, mm. uh, but instead um, that identified with their clan. And she was definitely a clan, uh, a clan leader. So anyway, um, Good. yeah, so, uh, I could go, I've got the, um, yeah, I've got the timeline here. It's interesting. Um, there was a war in 1918 where she sided with the frontier force. This is a war when a lot of Pali people, especially the Jorquele people uh, closer to Banga, were fighting the, the frontier force over the imposition of the hut tax. So, um, so she, uh, she was the only one that really sided with the frontier force at that time. And then uh, the Jaqueles were eventually conquered and defeated in 1921. Hmm. So um, the question here is, uh, it seems like she was trying to protect her people and she was trying to do the best thing, um, looking at the long-term uh, uh, future, she realized that the Liberian state was going to expand and was going to annex all these territories and that fighting them was pretty much a losing battle. So it would be kind of hopeless to fight them. And the reason, one of the reasons is you look at the, the weapons, if you look at the comparison of weapons that were going on here, we have the, uh, the Liberian Frontier Force was using uh, M1 rifles and Schofield rifles, and they even had mobile field cannons. So if you can imagine, they're dragging these cannons into the field uh, with them, these cannons that could knock down these uh, fortified village walls easily. So um, the indigenous armies at that time, like the Jarquelli uh, Pele army, for example, had uh, bows and arrows, um, cutlasses, axes, blow darts, they use poisonous arrows, uh, shields and spears, and then war medicine, which is protective, you know, uh, amulets and things like that. So if you look at the two weapons, you know, sets of weapons that they're using, right. you can see that it's a lopsided uh, yeah. battle going on there. Yeah. So, so thank you so much for that summary, Dr. Nevin. Do yeah. we know exactly how she became chief? Is it through election or was the power, you know, handed down to her from maybe the previous chief? Right. We don't know exactly. There's no written records of that transfer of power uh, when she became chief. But we believe that, as I said, we believe that uh, maybe sometime in the 1890s, if she's born in the 1850s, then uh, she would be about... Um, she would be about 40 years old uh, in 1890. Uh, we know that her mother was a Zoe, which is, you know, ritual specialist and high ranking 
uh, office, officer or official in the Sandy Society, probably also a member of the Poro Society as well, because some of the high ranking officers in Sandy were also uh, inducted into Poro. But um, we don't know exactly when, but we do know that um, she did not rule uh, as an autocrat. These, she had a council of elders. So she had to confer with her council of elders. And a lot of these elders were, of course, uh, men. Um, and also, the way that she ruled was in the, the same exact way that a male chief would rule. She uh, used the same tactics and the same strategies that, that a male uh, a chief would use. But she did confer with her council of elders. And as you know, um, in these sort of direct democracies where there's no election process in terms of voting or anything like that, but the chief has to maintain the confidence and the trust of the people. And chiefs can be removed uh, with the help of the council of elders if they abuse their power. Uh, as chiefs, or if the people believe that they're not following the best interests of the people, chiefs can be deposed, and that, that happens all the time. So um, she was never deposed, and so you know, we believe that means that she had the confidence and the trust of her people. And, and was it historical at that time for female to become chief? Were there other female chiefs in other... Right. Uh, not too many... There are um, in neighboring uh, Sierra Leone, which, you know, Sierra Leone is your sister country, the sister country to Liberia. In Sierra Leone, um, there's a famous female chief named um, Mami Yoko, whose husband was a paramount chief, and then he died, and then she became chief after him. So there's actually a recently a book published on all of the uh, famous female chiefs in Sierra Leone. I think it goes into the life stories of about uh, eight or nine uh, female chiefs in Sierra Leone. Also in Ghana, you have some powerful uh, female figures like Ya Asantewa, for example, in the Ashanti War uh, as a leader. You also have in Nigeria, there's, there are several uh, female chiefs during the uh, British colonial period in Nigeria. Uh, there were some um, some famous female chiefs. But in Liberian history, uh, you can only name really uh, one or two. There was a female chief in, in Kakata in the 1950s that was um, that was designated by uh, by President Tubman. Um, I'm blanking out on her name right now, but there's uh, there's not too many in um, in Liberian history. And that's why it's kind of ironic that. You know, Liberia elected the first female president on the African continent, which is Madam uh, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf being the first elected female head of state um, on the entire continent of Africa. So that's that's really, really interesting. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, Madam Swakoko is, is, is uh, fairly unique in that regard. Right. I was uh, conducting the show and someone said, uh, Many chiefs, especially in Nimba, there were female. And if I, uh, she said, Madame Swakoko was not the first. There were other mm -hmm. big chiefs, but uh, history recorded mainly Madame Swakoko. But my question is, uh, right. if you look at the timeline as to when she became chief, is there is there a likelihood that she was perhaps imposed by the government in Monrovia? Uh, no, no, she wasn't imposed by the government, Roy. She um. She formed a strategic alliance with President Daniel Howard. And the reason she did that was because uh, she was attacked. Her people were attacked, um, we believe, by uh, Wolomian, the, the warrior Wolomian uh, from Tomu Town, which is not that many miles away. I actually visited Tomu Town on the motorbike. But... Um, that I saw, I visited the grave of Wolomian and I interviewed the elders there in Tomu Town. They tell a different story, but anyway, they, they say that they were allies. But anyway, the point is that 
she was definitely attacked and um in in around 1911 uh, uh, in Gensalu, which is another village which is not too far from where Swakoko is today, but it's closer to the village of Sinye, which is north of the Cuttington University campus. Anyway, uh, so her original village was attacked and burned down and she had to take her people and flee and live in exile for a number of years, I believe it was two or three years with her people. They were living uh, sort of in exile out of their home area. Um, and eventually she negotiated a peace and she was able to come back and then she established uh, Swakoko town. But uh, she uh, traveled to Monrovia in 1912 and met with the uh, uh, with President Daniel Howard during his first year of rule in order to ask for his assistance in protection um, in protecting her people. And he sent um, uh, a few people. There's this guy named uh, General Harper that was sent up to Bong County. Um, and another guy named Sergeant Coley, which is uh, where you get the name uh, Sergeant Coley's Town, SKT. Okay. He, he was a Mandingo officer who um, was uh, with the Frontier Force, and he set up a base in uh, Sergeant Coley's Town, SKT, which is very close to Swakoko. Uh, and so um, there's also a story that her daughter had a had a son with uh, General Harper. Um, there's also other stories that she had a, a, a sexual liaison or some kind of um, love affair with uh, President Howard himself, which I, I don't think that's actually true. But uh, there was some of those you know rumors floating around because she might have actually visited him twice. We only know about the 1912 visit where she was carried in the uh, Alenkeen, um, uh, uh all the way down to Monrovia. But um, President Daniel Howard uh, met with several chiefs uh, in the executive, um, in his executive offices, you know, in Monrovia, but he did not travel into the hinterland the first Liberian president to actually go out into the hinterland and travel and meet uh, chiefs in the hinterland was uh, President C.D.B. King, which is Charles Dunbar Burgess King, starting in um, 1920 when he became president. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, if you are just joining us, this is Focus on Liberia. We are discussing the life and time of Chief Swakoko. My guest is Dr. Tim Nevin, who has been professor of history at Cottington University and also Tadma College. There are a lot of questions coming, but let me uh, ask a few questions here sure. about uh, still with the association of uh, the government of Liberia. The frontier force was known to be very ruthless. Mm -hmm. And so, Siding with how did Mana Swakoko manage to be clean relatively with her association with the frontier force that was very br brutal? Yeah, they were. The thing is that uh, a lot of the foot soldiers. So I wrote I wrote an article, a, a long research article on the history of the Liberian frontier force, um, starting in 1908 when they were organized uh, in Monrovia. The thing is that um, a lot, you know, there was several mutinies. The soldiers, the the rank and file soldiers in the frontier force mutinied several times because they weren't getting paid. And so um, it's sort of like operation pay yourself. You know, um, a lot of the soldiers were uh, given the freedom to uh, take what they call war wives when they defeated or conquered an area, sometimes they would forcibly kidnap women uh, and take them as, as their country wives. Uh, also, they could also take livestock and things like that for themselves because they weren't getting paid, you know, so, uh, or at least they weren't getting paid on time. Um, the other thing with the frontier forces, 
the first uh, ethnic groups, you know, uh, we don't call them tribes anymore, but the first ethnic groups to be recruited into the, uh, uh, into the Liberian frontier force were the Loma people, uh, sometimes called Buzi, you know, uh, Loma people, and also um, Mano and uh, Gio or Don people, uh, soldiers recruited from the north, from the northern parts of uh, what is now Liberia. And there were historical animosities between uh, northern groups and coastal groups like the Basa people and the Day people uh, and the Vi people. So and, and I really have a question about that because we see, yeah, sure. we see some form of that animosity today. Yeah, and sure. It's root back there. Yeah, sure. There's historical animosities because, as I said, uh, you won't. Um, it's it's incredible to believe, but in Liberia, um, President King was the one that formally and legally abolished slavery and pawning. And that was in the year 1930. So we believe Madame Swakoko died four years later in 1934. So for most of her life, uh, this pawning and, and slavery was, was still going on. You know, and there's a lot of different types of slavery. And I realize that's a loaded word. And we don't want to compare um, the, the slavery that was going on in Liberia uh, to the transatlantic slavery, which was a, a, a different system, you know. But mm -hmm. um, as you know, pawns were sometimes used uh, in, in lieu of paying the hut tax, for example. So you had a child who's given to someone for a loan of money, and then they would work for that person until the loan was paid off. But sometimes the pawn would become essentially a virtual slave because yeah. the loan would never be paid off and the person would just work until they became an adult, you know, um, until they were freed, from, which is essentially a, a form of debt bondage. So, um, but other people were kidnapped, you know, um, mono people, for example, kidnapped and sold um, down to the coast and sometimes sold into the transatlantic slave trade network uh, from slave dealers and slave traders on the coast. Places like Basa Cove, you know, for example, was a slave trading uh, um, a depot. You know, other places like that Grand Cape Mount, you know, there was slave trading going on there um, into the transatlantic slave trade. That's a whole nother issue, yeah. of course. Yeah. And I, uh, I taught an entire class on the transatlantic slave trade. So I, I, I do have a background in that, that uh, very tragic and terrible history. But uh, we're talking about domestic slavery in this yeah. case. You know, uh, the Vi people, they did have plantations. Um, they were growing, um, growing uh, different crops. And so they did have chattel slavery, but mostly they had domestic slavery. Uh, you know, people working for them in the household and things like that. So, um, so that was going on, oh. and slavery was abolished uh, by law in 1930. Thank you. We're going yeah. to take a short break, and after that, we're going to bring on comments from our viewers. They are Great. looking at the show, they are watching, and they are asking a lot of questions. Great. So, stay tuned. We're going to be right back. Welcome back. This is Focus on Liberia. My guest is Dr. Timothy D. Nevin, professor of history at Tutmer University and also Cottonwood University. We have a lot and of former. questions here. <laughs> former, former professor. Right, former. <laughs> former, he's back in the States. Very good. 
Yeah. So I, I also and I also taught you know I also taught African history uh, at uh, Old Dominion University, which is a public university in uh, Norfolk, Virginia, uh, for several years as well. But um, before I go to the first question, I wanted to talk about music for a second. Music and Madame Swakoko. Sure. We we have oral traditions that Madame Swakoko was a music lover. She loved music, and in her compound, her fortified compound, she had musicians, and she also had dancers. And these people would perform when she had guests. So when she was hosting guests, uh, strangers, you know, outsiders, she would bring her musicians uh, into the central part of the compound, and they would uh, put on dances, and they would play traditional music using the sangba, uh, you know, which is the pressure drum and um, and sing. And some of her uh, most uh, popular songs, or I'd say her favorite songs, were uh, songs from the Sande Bush. So when you have the breaking of the bush, which is the graduation of the young girls that are coming out of the, the Sande Bush after they've graduated, they sing and they dance and they sing these songs. And those were some of Madame Swakoko's favorite songs to hear performed. And um, apparently she had some amazing dancers uh, in her compound as well. Uh, one of her favorite dancers, this woman who could do this elaborate dance with a bowl of water on her head. She could do this great dance without spilling one drop of water. That was according mm -hmm. to the oral traditions. Okay, quickly, let's... Uh... Look at these few pictures. This is, uh, and as we put the picture, you can say one or two comments on that picture, Dr. Yeah, okay, very good. So this is taken by the Harvard African uh, Expedition in the year 1926. And so um, I'll let my viewers guess how old Madame Swakoko was in this photograph. This is actually a still photograph from a silent film that was taken. We've got about eight minutes of film of her uh, speaking, but it's silent. So I'm guessing that, you know, Madame Swakoko was maybe about 70 or 80 years old in that in that photograph, uh, but that's just an estimate. And um, this is her, one of the buildings inside her compound. You can see the, the large, the tall fence on the outside, on the right there, that's for protection against um, attack. So um, in order to get into the compound, you had to go through a, a doorway area that's kind of like a um, like a, a narrow passageway to get inside the compound that could easily be, easily be blocked off during the attack. So um, this is uh, Chief uh, Arthur Wena. He was a friend of mine and he was a chief in Swakoko in 1915, uh, sorry, uh, recent times in 2015 is actually when he passed away. Sadly, he passed away a few weeks after we took this photograph. This is a uh, cast iron pot that belonged to Madame Swakoko and now is the belongs to the Wena family in Swakoko. And this is a large cast iron pot that was used to cook rice. And we're talking about country rice, not the imported Sava rice, but the country rice. And then um, here we have a plaque on the left side from the Madame Swakoko uh, Center for Rural Women's Empowerment that's on the Cuttington University campus. Um, that's a plaque with an imaginary kind of drawing, imagining what she may have looked like uh, on the left. In the middle is uh, supposedly this is a uh, a mortar you know you've got a mortar and pestle and this um, mortar was supposedly used by Madame Swakoko to ground the grind her uh, chewing tobacco uh, what you call snuff which is um, snorting tobacco for snorting so she was a big fan of uh, snuff which is uh, snorting tobacco and also um, on the right side this is a photograph of a bracelet, which is a brass bracelet. This is courtesy of uh, Vice President uh, Jewel Howard Taylor. Um, so some of the elders, the women in Swakoko gave this bracelet uh, to uh, Jewel Howard Taylor. 
and they told her that this bracelet was once um, a possession of Madame Swa Coco. And so this was a, a gift to her. Uh, this photograph on the left um, is of Madame Swa Coco's grandson, uh, Muba Yongo, and he became a chief. And then two of his wives uh, are there. Um, in the middle, we've got Madame Swa Coco's grave, which is the grave site is on the, the exact location of her kitchen, her kitchen compound, which was in the middle of her property in, uh, in Swakoko town. So this grave was refurbished uh, several years ago with tile, and that's courtesy of uh, Jewel Howard Taylor uh, as well. And then um, this is just an old uh, uh, artistic map of Liberia from 1956, and it actually shows Swakoko on the map. You can see the St. Paul River up there, and then you can see the the town of Swakoko uh, on the map. So um, Swakoko, as you might know, is uh, 10 miles south of Banga. So Banga is the largest city, and that's where the Paramount Chief was located at that time in, in Banga. So. Thank, thank you, Doug. Let's go to our comments and questions. The yeah. first one here from Jackie Sire say, our young people need to know our history. Unfortunately, many are involved in fluff. The curriculum needs to be infused with our history. Tamba Suni, good to know the history about Madame Swakoko. Thanks, Dr. Nevin. Uh, Ram Bilite, hi, Doc. Thanks for your continued focus on Liberia. Yes, we work at Tatma together. Glad you are still contributing. Mm -hmm. Nice. Uh, Kemal Dix, her granddaughter is online. Adeline Kaipo, Madame Swakoko was my grand aunt. She got some mm. uh, family members here. Kemal Dix live here in Metro Atlanta. She said she was my grand aunt. The granddaughter of Madame Swakoko is online watching. Welcome, wow. to Sister Kaipo, granddaughter of Swakoko. Mm. We also heard from Francis Rosen. The people that come from America and the West Indies were free men and they met slaves here. Th that's mm -hmm. a continual theme in uh, mm -hmm. that uh, there were slavery people in Liberia. Dr. Never, you can comment on that, that uh, mm -hmm. there's always this uh, friction between settlers and indigenous Liberians say, well, mm -hmm. the people came, they were free, but you were the one there practicing slavery. How dare you fight them and say they were having a domestic slave or they were enslaving uh, indigenous Liberians when you were there practicing slavery. Uh huh. Who are you referring to? What do you mean by you? Uh, uh indigenous Liberians practicing uh -huh. slavery. Ex slaves yeah. came, came and they would settle in Liberia. And yeah. Through, because most of the time, the ex slaves have been accused of uh, mm -hmm. domestic slavery. Right, right, right. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it has to do, it also has to do with, you know, different understandings or conceptions of this concept of slavery and there's a lot of different kinds of slavery going on you know like i said uh the transatlantic slave trade is something that you know people that were caught up in the transatlantic slave trade almost never uh came back they almost never came back to see their their home again you know um whereas uh, other domestic forms of slavery uh, or pawnage, you know, at some point you might be able to uh, be re redeemed um, or manumitted or whatever. But um, it's true that, uh, you know, that's a whole nother discussion. I mean, yeah. you know, really what happened was Madame Swakoko was protecting people. She was taking people in as pawns and as wards and things like that. And she was raising them and feeding them and protecting them. And then in the long run, that was beneficial for her because uh, she had more labor power under her control. So she had huge uh, rice fields, country rice, and she had an animal's village where she was raising all these livestock, uh, cows and ducks and, and chicken, and probably guinea fowl as well, you know, all these um, animals. Um, she had warriors and uh, hunters that could go and get bushmeat for her. Uh, when someone killed a leopard, 
she would demand some of that leopard meat, you know, as her own portion. So, um, because a leopard is kind of a symbol of the of the chiefdom of a chief, you know, uh, mm -hmm. she wore uh, leopard uh, teeth, you know, um, around her as well, part of her regalia. So anyway, um, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, that's kind of off topic. You, you yeah. know, that would be kind of the topic for another program. And, and we're, we're going to do that. We're going to call yeah. you. Let's go back. Or yeah. Asana say, please tell us something about the vice script and how it was used by Germany during World War II. Mm -hmm. Again, a little off topic. But this piece here that say anything about Paramount Chief Lango Limpe of Kakata. Yeah, what? thank you, thank you, thank you. Lango Lepe, exactly. So she's the other Paramount Chief that I was, I was forgetting her name earlier, but that's exactly correct. And she was uh, uh, made a Paramount Chief, a Paramount Chief by President uh, William V.S. Tubman. And that was, I believe, around 1952 or something like that, in the early 50s. And she was uh, in Kakata. So she was a paramount chief after uh, Madame Swakoko. So let me comment a little bit about how we know uh, or we have an educated guess about the lifetime, the period of Madame Swakoko's life. In other words, the year she was born and when she died. Um, we have another film of Madame Swakoko. I wish I could have showed it to you uh, earlier, but it's a film taken by a Dutch explorer named Paul Julian. He was actually an anthropologist, and he traveled across Liberia in the year 1933. He visited Madame Swakoko's compound. He stayed overnight uh, as, a, as a guest of Madame Swakoko. And he said at that time, he took some fit, uh, some footage of her. In 1933, Madame Swakoko was old and blind already. She had lost her eyesight. Uh, and she was sort of on her deathbed uh, in 1933. So based on that and also based on oral traditions, we believe that she really did die in 1934, a year later. Uh, when she died, so... We look at those photographs of her in 1933. She's having a hard time breathing. Uh, she's blind and she's very old. We believe that she was approximately uh, 80 or 85 years old. So if you take that year 1934 and then you subtract 80 years, that's where you come up with the birth date of approximately 1850 for her birth date. So that's how... And and uh, unfortunately, the dates on the tombstone are wrong; they're not correct. But but uh, but anyway, that's that's how we arrived at that um, at that uh, conclusion that we believe that she died around the age of uh, eighty five or so, and in nineteen thirty four. And one birthday on that uh, thumb, not the tombstone, but that uh, yeah, it says uh, she was born September twenty three. I believe yeah. that because that's my birthday too. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> so those are just made up, you know, those are just made up dates because the thing is that uh, no one was writing down the dates, of course, yeah. uh, back in the 1850s. What happened was um, people would remember, people would keep track of the years based on the harvest. Right. So the number of harvests, you know, every year you have one major harvest in the, you know, and so uh, that's how people would keep track of the number of years. And some people would be named after uh, a time of uh, famine or a time of drought or things right. like this. So people could estimate how old they were based on their name and, and things like that. And we'll remember how many harvests, you know, uh, old are you basically. Yeah. But people were not using the Western Gregorian calendar that's got, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, okay, Thursday. Exactly. You know, they weren't using that. Right. They weren't Sometimes using they were that using in the hinterland. Now, of course, the settlers were using that calendar in Monrovia and in Greenville and in Harper. Uh, when the settlers came after the, in the 1820s, of course, they were using the Western calendar. 
but in the hinterland nobody was using that so yeah right so those are just made up dates you know we don't know. i guess it uh dave just said considering the current assigned or imposed roles of women in liberia how did a woman come to such prominence and dominance in such age well, that's a great question. And I think that the reason is because of her force of personality, her force of personality. She had a way of getting people to follow her commands and listen to her. She was so respected by people. And you can see in a in an oral society where no one's writing anything down, um, someone's word is so much more important you know mm -hmm. um you know people could say oh yeah this is written down in a book but anybody could write anything when i say something it's like my entire character is being put on the line you know because my word is uh is backed up by my reputation right yeah. so if i break my word then that hurts my reputation right so right. she had a very strong personality and she had a very a good reputation as someone who was an impartial peacekeeper, someone who could sit two warring parties down and she could uh, work out some sort of peace settlement between the two parties. So she had warriors that were under her command but she herself was not a warrior. She was a diplomat. She was a peacemaker. And she was uh, what you would call uh, someone who was well-versed in the arts of diplomacy right. and hospitality. So, and, and yeah. Was, so was so really I think cool. that it was her, her force of personality that really uh, brought her to the fore. And then, of course, at a certain point, she uh, she really um, controlled a large number of people. Right, and I heard she was beautiful also. Right, well, of course they're gonna say that, of course, you know. Um, uh, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, as you know. Right. So the beauty is a very subjective thing. And um, she, were, she very well could have been beautiful, uh, obviously in the eyes of her suitors. We believe that as I said before, she had five uh, sons and about four daughters. A lot of them didn't survive. A lot of those sons and daughters didn't survive, but most likely um, there were multiple fathers. So most likely mm. she was having, you know, children uh, with different men. And a lot of that could have been political. So she could have been for, uh, forming political alliances with other male chiefs and other male chiefs who were also warriors who also commanded uh, large numbers of uh soldiers indigenous soldiers and warriors under their command so uh, she could have been using these alliances um in a political way uh, as well mm -hmm. but most likely those nine children um had you know a, a few different fathers it's not it's not by the same yeah. you know just one man so, um, so hey, you know, she might well have been a very uh, beautiful, physically attractive, but once again, uh, what is physically attractive and beautiful in one society might not be beautiful or, or attractive in another society. Right. You look at okay. um, Elizabeth, uh, Elizabethan England, you know, England under the reign of Elizabeth I, and their ideal of beauty is very different from our ideal of beauty today. True. And the re reference we're making was beauty in the uh, in Pella country. But let's go to Franklin yeah. Waller. He said, what was the relationship between her and her male counterparts? Was she domineering, assertive mm -hmm. in the expansion of her territory? That's a great question. Thank you, Franklin. Uh, calling in from Baltimore. I appreciate that. Um, well, we have the oral traditions here. We don't have uh, very much in the written record to go by. But what I'm trying to do is fuse the, the written record with the oral traditions handed down by the elders 
in uh, what's today Bonk County. So, um, as I said, she had a very strong personality, um, um, and she had so many years of training in Sanday in the Sanday Bush that she became uh, an instructor uh, and a leader, and also a senior official in Sanday society. So part of that has to do with leadership skills. You know, you don't become a senior official in Sanday without developing strong leadership skills. That's part of the, that's part of the education. So, um, so in terms of her relationship with different men, it's very interesting because the, uh, one of the oral traditions says that um, the warrior Beto kidnapped the mother of the warrior Wolomian, and Wolomian wanted Madame Swakoko to join him to fight against the army of Beto, and she refused. And this is why Wolomian came and burned down her, attacked her town, and she had mm -hmm. to flee. Uh, and things like that. But other other oral traditions from Tomu Town, which is where Wolomian is buried, uh, those oral traditions say that Wolomian and Madame Swakoko were allies and even possibly, um, you know, uh, had a uh, loving relationship, you know, were, mm -hmm. had, had, a, had a, a personal alliance going on. So it's kind of hard to um, to tease out those those details, but clearly uh, she had uh, very strong relationships with male leaders, and she also formed a personal relationship with the president of the Republic of Liberia, which is Daniel Howard. You know, we believe that he might Daniel Howard might have even given her uh, some kind of a medal and a certificate to take back. Uh, to Swakoko town with her. Those things have not survived, but um, but she did form several strong bonds with male leaders, yeah. Did her gender play a role in her decision to align with the frontier force against her clan? I don't think it was against her clan. Uh, not not against her clan. It was the, the Jokwele clan. Um, yeah. Jokwele. Jokwele people, which is a little bit to the north of her, Closer to Banga, the the Jaqueli people, they did fight the uh, the frontier force, and at one point their army even captured the frontier force's flag. You know, the the regiment had a flag, and and they captured the frontier force's flag in one battle. So they actually defeated the frontier force in a battle, but in the long term, you know, war the Jaquelis were defeated. And what they call pacified, and um, but the Jaqueli people were not um, allied to the Swakoko people. They were, they were not really, um, you know, working together in general. So anyway, when the um, when the Jaqueli's were uh, defeated in 1921 by the Frontier Force, what that means is they have to start paying the hut tax. That means they lose their autonomy, and they're one of the last groups, the last clans, you know, in what is now Liberia in the Republic to lose their independence, you know, to Monrovia. So that's what it means is once you're defeated and you lose your political autonomy, you have to start paying the hut tax. Mm. So that's kind of the sign that you're no longer independent. Um but no, I don't think her gender played a role in those negotiations and such. I, I just think that as a leader, she was using the same tactics and the same strategy that a male chief would have used. Yeah. Um, but I, I think that her ultimate goal was to protect the best interests of her own people. Aliu Samba said before the formation of Liberia, there were a lot of women in authority all over the country. Mm -hmm. Well, you know that uh, not not as much as uh, Sierra Leone or Nigeria, but the reason we're focusing on Madame Swakoko 
is that by far, I can say this definitively, by far, Madame Swakoko is the most famous, the most well-known female chief in Liberia. Dave Jassy, it is ironic that Liberians celebrate Ellen Johnson Salif more than they celebrate their historical female leaders. Maybe one reason is uh, we don't know. We don't know them, right? Yeah. Well, there, there's also some people that will sing the praises of whoever's in power. Yeah. Good question. This one is a long one from uh, Dr. Semyon Govo. Say thank you very much, team, for uh. this history. We first met at Indiana University in Bloomington during our research trips there. You have great passion for Liberian history, especially the history of Liberian music. Your research raises many questions regarding the efforts of many traditional leaders such as Swakoko, Mumbulu, Vojo of Bandi land, and Duma of Gola land in the nation building of Liberia. But none of these people are glorified or remembered in Liberian history. It baffles me. Uh huh. Well, I think that there are steps being taken to remedy that. Um, as you know, uh, Front Street what in Monrovia was renamed Salboso Street. Uh, I believe you've got Salboso Bridge, you know, as well. Um, with Madam Swakoko, the highway, like I said, the highway in Bonk County is named the Swakoko Highway. Um, there's no statues to her yet, but um, there's a memorial plaque where you go and see the uh, grave of uh, King Salboso, which also known as King Boatswain. So, I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, the vice president of the Republic, which is Jewel Howard Taylor, has taken on this honorary title of um, honorary Madam Swakoko. She's taken on this title as a honorary name. And because um, she's from Bonk County, her father's from Bonk County. So, um, you know, um, I think that things are changing slowly and it takes a while for things to change. But I think that, uh, you know, we can't really talk about Liberian textbooks in the classroom because most of the students don't have any. Yeah. Jimmy Eastburn, did hot tax and government revenue used to encourage trade and development in the counties? Little off topic, Jimmy, but let, let's start. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, you know, the hot tax, uh, Really, what it did was, on a large scale, it, it started encouraging more pawning of, of people yeah. um, from families, you know, like uh, younger children, things like that. But on the long term, you know, especially when Firestone came in 1926, remember, Madam Swakoko died in 1934, so a few years later. But when, when Firestone came, the, the collection of the hut tax uh, uh, was one way of forcing people into the monetarized economy. In other words, the money economy. So people were forced to pay the hut tax with coin, with currency, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, people were using British pound coins and stuff like that to pay the hut tax. So people were actually forced to go work for Firestone in order to earn cash wages in order to pay the hut tax. So the hut tax was a way to force people into wage labor, to working for wages yeah. for the first time. Right. Because as you know, Firestone had this huge enormous demand and need for uh, 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 laborers, especially tappers, uh, to, uh, to be trained and to work on the uh, what became the world's largest rubber plantation, which is Firestone Plantations. Jackie Sayer said, it seems that women's contribution in history is always diminished by sexual innuendos. It could also be that she was a strong and brilliant strategist. And uh, she followed that by saying, we say that King Peter was handsome and had numerous different 
numerous children by different women. And uh, I think that was when we were talking about, when I asked the question that uh, Madam Swakoko was beautiful. And to that question, before you come in, uh, Jackie, I would say yes. Uh, most of our African chiefs will talk about their many wives, like uh, Sami Jai in uh, Sino County had 50 children and from different wives. And I think when it comes to the chief, those things are always mentioned. Yeah, Your thing. Uh, I can, I can uh, reply to that. Um, the, the way that Madam Swakoko was utilizing the same strategies, and she was a brilliant strategist, was Madam Swakoko uh, went through these ceremonies so that she, uh, and I talk about this in my article, she actually married a lot of these young women uh, formally so that uh, when young suitors would come, they would have to pay her the bride price, you know, to take these women, these young women away. So she was doing the same thing. It's called uh, a polygamous society. You know, this is a polygamous society at that time where uh, chiefs, especially who could afford to provide for more than one wife, uh, would do that. And you have an agricultural society where the more children that are born, means the more help in the fields, the more help at harvest time. Um, so of course, uh, the more wives you have, that means the more children you're able to produce and uh, people that uh, whose labor power you control. And so this is a, uh, a strategy in agricultural society. And Madame Swakoko did the same thing. She had all these people under her control and she would use their labor power for to amass wealth uh, for the benefit of her own people so that she could protect her own people. So she was using the same strategy. Now, in terms of the beauty question about uh, being beautiful, what I would like to do is um, take those still photographs from 1926 and use uh, one of those programs where you can do a computer image and go back in time and try to um, create a, a possible image of what someone looked like when they were younger. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So there are these computer programs that can put together uh, a possible image of what someone may have looked like when they were younger based on a photograph of them when they are old. You know, it's kind of a uh, generating um, a possible, uh, a possible sort of mugshot of the person, yeah. and I would love to do that with Madame Swakoko, so we could get a generated, computer-generated image of what she may have looked like when she was, you know, 25 years old or or 20, you know, years old in the prime of her youth. So, uh, and and very well, she she very well may have been you know, a strikingly a beautiful person, but we know that more important, uh, more important than beauty, she was, uh, a, she was a brilliant person who, who came to be a very strong leader. Thank you. Save the state library, say we had numerous women leaders before Swakoko. She wasn't an anomaly. Many of our towns are named after women leaders. Mm -hmm. And to that question, uh, E. Cholo Nyema said, do you know of any female leaders in Maryland County? You were there, Dr. Yeah. How much can you share about the different groups of the Gribo ethnic group? Uh -huh. Yeah, well, that, that's totally off topic. But yeah, um, yeah I mean, we, we can talk about Gribo history, you know, um, another time we'll have to do that, <laughs> you know. But um, I, I, don't, I can't think of any uh, uh, female Gribo chiefs off the top of my head. Um, and once again, like I said uh, before, uh, sure, there, 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 there very well have been, you know, um, many, uh, especially on the, uh, the town chief level, you know, female chiefs before. But once again, uh, by far, Madam Swakoko is by far the most well-known and the most famous of all the Liberian female chiefs. Right. So yeah. especially in Bonk County. So yeah. the farther you go away from Bonk County, 
the lesser she may be known, you know, the less well known she is. But um, her name is definitely being kept alive, uh, especially among uh, Pele speaking people. What would you say is a most significant contribution? Right, very good. So I think that Madame Swakoko's big contribution was that she led by example. And she was kind of like a Moses, Moses figure. I, I use this analogy in my paper, in my article, that she's kind of like Moses in that when she was attacked, she led her people um, out of uh, the danger zone. So she led by example. She wasn't just someone who talked a lot of uh, big talk or whatever, but she actually put her her safety on the line and she got her own people to a safe place. And she was constantly negotiating with other political leaders around her uh, and also negotiating with the government based in Monrovia um, to to um, protect her own people and to make sure that uh, that they had sort of the best of all possible worlds under her leadership. So her contribution is leading by example. And she was well loved when she died. The Sandy Society buried her and they kept her death a secret because it would have been very shocking. Um, they wanted time to be able to plan the funeral without people knowing that she had died. You know, she was so popular and so well loved that they had to plan the news of her death uh, in a very sensitive sort of way. Um, so, so she was very well loved when she died. And the other thing is that um, her grandson, and you mentioned this before the program started, her grandson, Moba Yongo, was, according to oral traditions, uh, he became a, um, a chief who uh, ended up being suffered from some kind of mental illness, either mental illness or he, he became abusive uh, to some people. And he was actually removed uh, from the chiefdom by Madame Swakoko. So the, the uh, lesson here is that Madam Swakoko was impartial and she was uh, willing to even remove her own grandson from a position of power when he became abusive or abused his, his power, whether that was through mental illness or some kind of sadism or something like that. But she removed him even though he was her grandson. And that was because it was in the best interest of her people to do that and replace him with someone more co uh, competent. That's good. So at a time, I mean, long before in the 1920s, nepotism in Swakoko uh, rule was, was, was not the case. And also at a time that even in the US, females were not allowed to vote. Right. We have female, we have female leaders. Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, definitely. You know, we uh, the the fight for uh, women's suffrage, you know, in the United States really heated up around World War One, uh, and with the suffragist movement, of course. And so, um, so the first state by like 1919, 1920, uh, that's when the the U.S. Constitution was finally changed, you know, to allow women to vote, but. Um, in the case of Madame Swakoko, we're talking about a stateless society, what you might call a direct democracy, where people are um, are putting trust and putting putting faith in their leaders, uh, along with a council of elders. So, in some ways, this is a gerontocracy, which means rule by elders. Yeah. Uh, and so. So definitely, um, you know, she 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 stood out for many different reasons. Yeah, it, it always says uh, winners write history. Uh, Save the state mm -hmm. say, you know, probably I think this is what she's talking about is uh, Swakoko became prominent simply because of her interaction with the Labrin government, and so mm -hmm. because the Labrin got because of her alliance with the Labrin government, 
they might have uh, protected her and uh, maybe have written some good things in her favor. Uh -huh. But I, I want to, I'm curious to know how was she taken in the whole Pella country? Was she looked at as some like a sellout since uh, she was cooperating uh -huh. with the central government? And these central government folks, they were conquering and adding them to. You know, other people were resisting. So how was right. she viewed at that time? Yeah. Well, she was definitely a hero to her people. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned that because uh, there is an oral tradition of um, after World War II, you know, when President Tubman was in power, uh, he was looking for a place to relocate Cuttington University uh, College from Maryland County to a central location mm -hmm. um, and also uh, Cary, which is um, the Central Agricultural uh, Research Institute. So these places, when President Tubman was looking for land, uh, large tracts of land to put these, put to, to locate these institutions, uh, there were some people in Bonn County that said, hey, why don't you put them next to Swakoko because, you know, she was the one who invited the Kui people into this area. So why don't you give them her land? And, of course, uh, she died in 1934, and the Cuttington University uh, College was brought to Bonk County in 1948 and 1949. So she died you know, about uh, 10 years or 12 years um, before Cuttington was brought to uh, Bonn County. But her influence of opening her arms to strangers and also her uh, embrace of a kind of non-racial viewpoint where she was happy sitting down to talking with people uh, from all different backgrounds, all different ethnic groups, of course. There were uh, several uh, white visitors, you know, European visitors that came and visited Madame Swakoko, and she hosted them uh, and, at different times. Um, and so, anyway, her embrace of strangers, uh, no matter what their background was, uh, gave her a reputation of... Um, you know, opening up the country to sort of the Kui people and um, the forces from uh, Monrovia. And so uh, there was many different reasons going into that decision to bring uh, Cary and CUC to, um, to Bonk County. And as you know, like I said, uh, the Cuttington University campus is located in the Swakoko district, and it's actually about uh, four miles from the town of Swakoko. Mohamed, Salia, Dugli, this will be our last comment. And can one say that Pele people are naturally loyal people and could this be the reason for the huge love and loyalty shown to Madame Swakoko? Um, what about what about the people in Nima County that are loyal to Prince, uh, Prince Yomi Johnson? Good, good answer. All right, that uh, before I, the Mandingo influence in that area. I, I was reading your article that uh, Madame Swakoko even sent her son or someone mm -hmm. even with her to go and study Mandingo. Right. What was the Mandingo influence like? And uh, SKT, that uh, that Sergeant Collie, Sergeant Collie, the dean of Loma or Mandingo. So let's talk a little bit about the Mandingo influence at that time. What were they yeah, doing? Yeah, Sergeant Coley was a Mandingo man, and he um, his his uh, his descendants uh, are still living in uh, SKT, and he's buried underneath a mosque, a small neighborhood mosque in SKT. That's where he's buried. So um, yeah, he was Mandingo and. Um, uh, the the Mandingo people were known for being long distance traders, of course, and especially involved in the kola nut trade, long distance kola nut trade. So they were buying kola nuts 
from the Mono and Gio people, that area, that forest region, and selling selling cola nuts in what is today Guinea uh, population centers in uh, in Guinea. But um, when the settlers came to Monrovia, which is which local people called Ducor, you know Ducor, back in the 1920s, there were already uh, Mandingo caravans that were coming down from what is today Guinea to trade with uh, the settlers and everything in the 1920s. So with Madame Swakoko, the what happened was she sent one of her relatives, a young man, to go and live in Mandingo country and, and learn the Mandingo language for several years. And then he came back to her court, her compound, and he became her translator. So when someone, a uh, Mandingo trader came, then he would act as a translator, uh, translating the conversation with Madame Swakoko. And once again, Madame Swakoko, she learned the various dialects of the Pele language, but Madame Swakoko never learned the English language and she never learned uh, Mandingo herself. So, um, so she had people that would translate for her. Thank you, thank you so much uh, for taking up the time. And we we'll definitely want to have you back. I want to learn a little more about Bele Yala. Yeah. And, uh, other things that you've dug into. And then about the, uh, some, your mom wanted to come back and talk about the Gribbles or something that you wrote about him from Maryland. Yeah, that's right. So I, I wrote an article about uh, this place called um, Devil's Rock, which is, uh, which is uh, half Graue, which is the nearest village. Anyway, Devil's Rock, like I said, is the uh, it's an earth shrine. It's this big rock uh, on the beach in um, about 45 minutes walk north of Harper City in Maryland County. Uh, I wrote a big article about that. I'd be happy to come and talk about that place. It's a real, a wonderful, magical place, you know. Um, and I'd be happy to come and talk about uh, Bella Yala. So I've got different. Um, different interests within Liberian history. Uh, and also, I've also written extensively of the history of the Liberian cultural troop. So the Liberian National Cultural Troop, which uh, was based on Providence Island. Um, so um, anyway, uh, I could, uh, I'd be happy to talk about, you know, any of those topics cool. um, in the future. Thank you so much, Doc. Oh, Jason yeah. Fosse, good to see you, Dr. Nevin. Great. Uh, yeah, good, Jocelyn, good. Excellent. All the way from London, I believe. And yeah, uh, I want to do a shout out to uh, to Sony, Sony Humu Sony, and uh, her mom, uh, Ma Darling Keita, if you guys are watching. I want to do a shout out to you guys um, and uh, anyone else I'm forgetting. <laughs> Thank you. So, Dr. Nevin, thank you so much. Let me have your final statement. Yeah, well, my final statement is that um, I hope that people continue to teach Liberian history at Cuttington University. Um, one thing, as, as I've taught Liberian history over the years, as an outsider, someone who's, you know, a white man from Chicago, who who's lived in West Africa for almost 10 years. But as an outsider, you know, I feel like I, I can be sort of objective sometimes. One thing I noticed about Liberian history and the way it's taught is that a lot of subjects in Liberian history are viewed as either rogues, you know, completely evil people uh, or saints, you know, um, and one good example of that is President Tubman, who ruled for 27 years. There's some people on one side that like to paint him as, as a developer, as a saint, as, you know, father of modern Liberia and just a great person. And other people take the opposite view and want to paint him as a very corrupt um, uh, dictator and all of this. So my point here is that no one is perfect. Right. In Liberian history or American history or European history, 
no one is perfect. Everyone has faults. Everyone has flaws. So you can't say that one person is just, you know, the pinnacle of everything. I'm sure Madam Swakoko had her, her, her faults and her personality flaws. I'm sure she didn't get along with everyone. Um, but, uh, but the point is that uh, the point of history and Liberian history is to try to understand the motivations that historical figures uh, were driven by. So what motivated them to make the choices that they did and what constraints did they have uh, there were constraints on the choices that they made. So we try to put ourselves in their shoes uh, or in their place and try to imagine what would have what would we have done if we were in their position. So um, we're trying to write a Liberian history that is balanced. It's not just focusing on the settlers, but focusing on indigenous Liberians as well. And it's also not trying to just deify someone or paint them as a saint or a, a perfect person, but trying to introduce some kind of a balance into our historical perspective. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nevin. Did you have any librarian name, Gribble name, Pella name? Um, yeah, so um, it was that one of my students who brought that up? <laughs> no, I yeah, guess um, I because they used my my students used to call me Pure Nimle. <laughs> and as you know, Pure Nimle was a folk hero. He was a um, a leader of the Nyamawe Grebo people, and he was one of the founding fathers, you know, of the clan. So I there was a book that was written called the the folklore of the Grebo people, and the story the the legend of uh, Pude Nimle, uh, who was an elephant hunter, you know, uh, and leader of his people. That that story, that legend, is included in that book, um, which was read, written by a Liberian named uh, Jangaba Johnson. Jangaba mm -hmm. um, S. Johnson. Anyway, so I was relating this story about Pude Nimle, and my students call, started calling me Pude Nimle. All right. So thank you so much for, it, yeah. for, for being our guest. We want to thank all our viewers for staying and watching here with us. Keep your dial set here at Focus on Liberia, where yeah. we educate, we elevate, and promote all things Liberia. Tomorrow, by the same time, we're going to be having Dr. George Clay Kia here. He's going to be presenting Liberian history as well. And we'll be talking about the development policies of some of our Liberian presidents. The first policy is autonomous capitalist development all the way to the PAPD. That's the propo agenda of President George Weir. Until then, from all of us here at Focus on Liberia, my name is Dennis Ja, wishing you a pleasant good night. Good night. God bless you. We are Liberia. Liberia is our Liberia people.